completely. Well, let's turn to the latest on coronavirus because the number of cases continue to climb around the world. The U.S. here has more than 1.8 million confirmed cases, and worldwide, that number has surpassed 6.4 million. Now, for more on this, I want to bring in Dr. Isaac Bogosh. Uh, he's an infectious disease specialist. And Dr. Bogosh, uh, let's first get to this news that we got out this afternoon. It was a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and all had to do with hydroxychlor hydroxychloroquine and the fact that it did not prevent people from contracting coronavirus. We know that this was touted by President Trump numerous times as a preventative measure, something that he personally even said had used. Uh, what are your thoughts on this and just what this means in terms of where we stand trying to contain this virus and also potential treatment out there? Yeah, I mean, obviously that's a disappointing result and uh, it was a very well conducted study. Before we had this study, there was really no empiric data to demonstrate whether or not hydroxychloroquine would work to prevent the infection or not. There was just speculation and, and a few, I would say, observational studies that just don't provide the same high quality uh, data. But now there's excellent data. It's a well-run study. It's a well-designed study and it shows that when we give this drug, it doesn't uh, prevent it in those who are exposed. It's disappointing. And, you know, we still, six months in, don't really have um, a huge toolkit full of tools that will help us treat or prevent this infection. We have remdesivir, which may shorten one's hospital stay if they're really sick. Uh, and that's about it. And that's about it. So lots of research going on, lots of promising drugs that we'll hear about in the weeks or perhaps few months ahead. But for now, well, we don't really have much. Dr. Anjali here. I'm curious about the this study, as well as, you know, against the backdrop of others, we've seen sort of the confusion and concern uh, over the other hydroxychloroquine studies in major publications like The Lancet and the New England Journal. Um, how does that affect your ability to really trust the data going forward? Okay. Yeah. I mean, you, you raise an incredible point. And the, there have been issues to date with some high profile studies that have questionable data that goes into them. And certainly some of those studies are under investigation. And this is really troubling because it erodes the public trust in science and medicine, and perhaps in the advice from public health officials. And it's awful. I mean, it does a lot more than just, you know, just portray data that might not be accurate. It can have a rippling effect uh, in the general community and, and this is, it has just, it's, it's, it's so damaging and it's upsetting to see. Uh, transparency is crucial. Data transparency is crucial. And for example, well, we'll see with this upcoming study that's going to be published, I think it's released at 5 p.m. today, you will see the utmost of data transparency. And, you know, anyone who needs to ask, who, who's curious about any particular part of the study can dig deep and answer those questions because the data is made available to the general public. Right. Um, and just pending to vaccines for a second, um, I know that Dr. Fauci talked to JAMA yesterday and, you know, we were talking about this timeline and there's a lot of focus on this timeline, whether or not it's going to be a 2020 or 2021. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, man, who knows? I mean, right, there's 130 vaccines that are under investigation, 10 of which are in human trials now. One of those 10 is in more advanced clinical trials. We'll probably have results of that in actually probably later this month. So probably late June, we'll hear if it has some efficacy in humans. That's pretty phenomenal if you think about it. We've only known this infection has existed for six months, and we're already in you know phase two, early phase three clinical trials for for one of these vaccines. Yeah, sure, it, it certainly might make some time. It takes some time. We only know that maybe two or three percent of these vaccines under investigation will actually reach the market. Uh, and you know, sadly, we have to be patient, but. You know, I always bet on uh, on human ingenuity, and and it looks like there are some very clever vaccines that are in more advanced stages of development, and I think we're going to have some successes soon. Doctor, what about the fact that uh, when President Trump announced that the U.S. Uh, is cutting ties with the WHO, can you speak to whether or not this at all complicates our efforts in order to find a vaccine? Yeah, I mean, I would say it complicates efforts for a multi multiple fronts well beyond COVID-19. So, of course, in the midst of a, a pandemic, the WHO is going to need all the funding it can have to really help manage this. And I appreciate that some people feel that there might have been, you know, some slip ups along the way or things could have been done better. Sure, let's fix it. Let's make it better. But to defund the quarterback for the global fight against this infection does not help anything. The other, the other issue, too, is 
there are so many other programs beyond COVID-19 uh, that really help low resource settings and, and low income and low middle income countries around the world. And uh, this is really going to have a tremendous negative impact in many low income countries. You know, these are things like food security, vaccine programs, health security. I mean, it's just, uh, it's, it's really gonna be a challenge for these places. So uh, it's a very disappointing move by uh, the US to defund the WHO. Hey, Dr. Bogosh, Rick Newman here. With um, most states now at some level of reopening, um, can you just tell ordinary people like us and like our audience, how, what is the best way to just move around? How comfortable should you be? Can you, can you basically uh, do anything as long as you're wearing a mask, for instance, or uh, is, are we, is, that, is that being too permissive? I think that's being too permissive. I mean, we know that we're in the midst of an epidemic. Certainly not every part of the United States is affected as badly as other parts of the United States, but you know, they don't call them communicable diseases for nothing. They're communicable. So we can easily transmit this from person to person. So the best thing to do at this point in time is uh, good hand hygiene, practice physical distancing. So in the US, they're saying stay six feet apart if you can. In Canada, we we're in the metric system like the rest of the world. So we're spending, uh, we're two meters apart. And of course, in areas where you can't practice physical distancing, put a mask on. I understand that some jurisdictions are requiring mask use for uh, entering some stores. Other places say it's, it's, it's voluntary. But if you're, not in an, if you're in an area where you can't be six feet apart from someone, you should, you should certainly have a mask on. It can reduce the spread of this infection. So those are, those are three simple things that people can do. Mask wearing in crowds, uh, physical distancing, hand hygiene. And I think the fourth one that's often forgotten is, you know, if there's high contact surfaces, if you're, for example, in an office building or a business, you wipe those down as frequently as possible with just any regular products will, will do the trick. All right, Dr. Isaac Bogash, great to have you on the show. I uh, hope to have you back soon. Thanks so much for taking the time. How's it going? Thanks for having me.